Do your people have psychological safety in their work environment? Do your people feel open and able to freely communicate with their superior, with their colleagues? Well, my, my guest today, Robert Glazer, is an author, an, a serial entrepreneur who's been incredibly successful, uh, a TED Talk speaker, the list goes on and on. But what he really is passionate about is about creating an environment for employees to authentically communicate up to and including, hey, I'm not happy here. Can you help me maybe find a different path, which could be a different company? This was one of the easiest conversations I've ever had on this podcast. Uh, Robert is just a wealth of knowledge and it just you'll just see it. It just flows from him, just flows from him. And you can tell when someone just is an absolute professional at what they do. Um, and he is the, uh, the definition of that. This one is packed with value. Robert Glazer is a serial entrepreneur, award-winning executive, best-selling author with multiple books, a keynote speaker, and has a passion for helping individuals and organizations build their capacity and elevate their performance. Robert is founder and board chairman of the Global Partnership Marketing Agency, Acceleration Partners, and was the co-founder and chairman of BrandCycle, which was acquired by Stack Commerce and TPG. Bob has, has significant experience in digital monetization, affiliate and partner marketing, customer acquisition, e-commerce, and direct-to-consumer marketing. This also includes experience with M&A on both the buy and the sell side, and he has served as a board member and advisor to many high-growth companies in the e-commerce and marketing verticals. Yes, he has done a lot, and we're going to talk about a lot, a lot of that today. So without further ado, Robert, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Roger. You betcha. You betcha. That was a mouthful to get started. You have done a lot. Yeah, sorry. Um, I should give you the short version next time. <laughs> no, that was great. That was great. And I definitely want to talk about your book, Elevate Your Team. Um, I, I, I've been reading it for about a week. I finished it this weekend. I want, to, I want to dive into some specifics around there. But can you just, you know, in a nutshell, just uh, maybe an abbreviated version of what is your background before you accomplished all the stuff I, I, I share with the audience at the beginning? Robert, what really what was your background and, and got you into this this path, if you will? Uh, <laughs> what got me into the path was probably a lot of failure of of trying to follow a path that was not the right one. And I was always a creative and entrepreneurial kid, and I was sort of pushed to you know stay on the rails and keep 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 it down and follow the program. And so I eventually that just wasn't working for me, and I became pretty unemployable uh, working <laughs> for other people. And so. Um, I went out on my own and and I was reluctant. You know, I had the DNA of an entrepreneur, but I had a lower risk tolerance. But once I made that switch, uh, I, I went sort of full full bore in that in that direction. And so that 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 was there were two key kind of inflections in my career. That that was one of them. And then actually kind of sitting down and figuring out my personal core values, which I talk about mm -hmm. a little bit and elevate your team, and yep. then deciding to orient kind of my life and family and business around that um, was really that second inflection. And, and virtually, I tell everyone, virtually everything that is read in my bio comes after that second inflection. Wow. Well, then let's let's start right there. Uh, I've I learned too late in life around business because I worked for big companies for 25 years before I went on my own seven years ago. And like you, I had a little bit of risk aversion. Um, I had the entrepreneurial spirit, always loved sales, marketing, but to go out on your own, you know, that's, it's, it's a big step, but I really, and I, we always had values. Of course, they were in a wall or in there, they were in a binder in the bottom of my desk for every company, but it was a business partner I currently have that really introduced me to the importance of knowing your values because the decisions get really easy. Consequences could be tough. Yeah. And we, 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 we understand that in the corporate sense we see, and I was super delusioned with values because I would yeah. see this crap on walls when we walked into businesses and no one behaved that way. And then I, I met some extraordinary businesses and business leaders who really like, you know, that was how they ran their company. And that was the decisions were based on, on the values. And, and we yeah. understand how that makes companies better decisions. I think we, we lose sight of, well, how, you know, if we had total clarity on our personal core values, like how, how would we, it's the ultimate decision-making rubric. And, you know, my next book is actually, going to be kind of about that topic on a double click because I get asked about it the most. And, and there's a concept in there I talk about of the big three, which is your chosen vocation or where you work, 
uh, your your partner, life partner, you know, that you choose, mm -hmm. and then the community that you choose to live in. Mm -hmm. And I think if we don't have values alignment in those three areas, it just won't work. <laughs> um, and 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 so for it's actually the book is a parable, and it walks through someone who is. Um, going through the motions kind of understands this process and is trying to look at all three aspects of their life and figure out which, which ones are, are working and which ones are, are, are not working. If we can't, if, if you'll indulge us, I would love to hear more about when you said everything that I read in that bio really was after that inflection point of you sitting down at some point and saying, what are my personal values? Like, what are my core values? And though I just, if I'm reading between the lines, the way you said it, uh, it was almost like there was this epiphanal moment of when you did sit down and do, can you, can you talk about that? Yeah. So I, I went on a, uh, pretty intensive leadership, uh, retreat program, um, for a group I was in called entrepreneurs organization at the time. And they opened this up to some of their presidents and it was led by a man named Warren Rustan, who's gone on to be a mentor to me. And I, I went to this thing thinking that we were going to learn about how to lead and manage people better and like this external facing stuff. And I described the first two days as like this big mirror <laughs> that the people put on us. And they were like, who are you? What do you value? Like, how are you going to lead? I talk a lot about this to companies because I think even if they have like a standard for what they want from their leaders, I don't think they're saying that people, we, there's a specific type of of leader, right? I think the best leader, you know, in true kind of Jim Collins level four or five is deep authenticity. So it has to be aligned to who you are, not things that you're pretending to be. I think we all jump into leadership and we get a little bit of what I call the, you know, multicolor uh, Joseph and the multi multicolor dream code of like pulling from here and here and here and we put it all together and because it's what we really liked or what we really hated from other managers, but some of it's not us. So I came out of that realizing that, that, core values were really important. I felt like I was a very value driven person. I kind of knew what they were, but I couldn't articulate them. I didn't have them in front of me to say, this is why I should do something. This is so I, I went on sort of a six month journey, kind of looking up things, figuring that out, doing that process and finding it actually that there was nothing out there to do that. So eventually I would sort of invent that within our company as part of our leadership training, like a repeatable program. And then I actually opened it up later as a course that anyone could take. And I've had thousands of people now who have kind of spent that time to figure out their personal core values. And I think it's equally as life changing for all them as it was for me. Yeah. Yeah. And when you, you said you created it for your company, was it AP? Was it Accelerated Partners that you created it for? Was this yeah, for Accelerated company? Partners. We, I, we invested a lot in this holistic. I wanted to take that concept of leadership training that was kind of holistic for our best and upcoming people. And so I used them as a guinea pig. And I was like, look, this took me six months. How can I, what are the questions I could ask? How could I build you know, a process out of this? And after two to three times of doing it, we had a really good system to spend a few hours with everyone get the right questions, get the right answers and have them kind of started down that path. And it's just amazing to me when I, you know, I like having real discussions and kind of vulnerability and talking about things. And when you get into these discussions and, and, and you see that these two people can't get along and, and, and you try to figure out why, and it's like, it's core value kind of, uh, you know, discrepancies that are driven by like deep childhood <laughs> issues yeah. that, that, that show up in how we lead and how we manage t today. And a lot of it is formative things from our childhood that we are trying too hard to do the opposite or, or, or to double down on, on, on something that we valued. And a lot of people don't know how to articulate that and they don't know how to lean into that and they don't even know what it is, but it's driving them. I mean, I can tell you I've worked with multiple leaders who have a core value of trust. And the reason that they have a core value of trust is usually a violation of trust at some point in their mm -hmm. life. And as a result, they have learned to keep people close, be careful. Once you're in, you're in. But once you're out, you're, the key is thrown away. And when we dig in with them, they find that's how they were leading their teams, right? So people wow. who were a little bit late you know, to a meeting, missed a deadline, signals of trust, like they were thrown in jail. The key was gone. <laughs> but the person didn't even know it. Um, and when you looked at how they were like, people were, they were either in or they were out. And I remember one time, well, I don't really do that, but I don't give them assignments and I do this and I don't expect much of them. I'm like, well, you, then you're definitely doing that. Like they are, <laughs> you've determined that they are not trustworthy. Um, and when they can actually go back to a team and articulate that and say, Hey, I just want you to know something. Trust is really important to me. 
And here are the ways that it can be earned. And I trust first, but here are the ways that can be lost. And it's really hard for me once it's lost to get it back, right? That's, that is, I'm not saying that that person has the real reasons why that's important to them, but they should lean into that once they're, once they're aware of it and, and give people the playbook for that. Yeah. I I really appreciate you talking about how childhood, childhood, you know, the the formation of our personalities and that is who we are in life. And I, as I've led, it's how you show up as a leader. It's how you show up as a spouse and a child. Amen. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Amen. Um, (laughs) and we've talked on this podcast so much too about entrepreneurs. I don't know if I've ever talked to an entrepreneur that's been successful that doesn't have some trauma and that that's so relative, right? Trauma is defined on a scale that can be very different to each person, but something, and again, you know, no trauma, like probably don't have a chip on your shoulder. I, I call Maybe it formative no. experience, right? Yeah, I think yeah. It's speak, a, to, it's speak, a, speak to that. It's a, yeah, yeah. No, I just so, think, you know, trauma is an overused word these days, but we sure. all have formative experiences or things that we, we were young were kind of defining moments that were both positive and negative. And, you know, it, it, like I remember hearing the story about a CEO who his problem was he was the golden child. His mm. he, he was the first grandchild, the first kid. He tell you, his family was great and he developed a narcissism from it because everyone always made him the center of the universe. So you'd say, look, perfect parents, perfect everything. There was yeah. nothing, but it, 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 it had its own thing. So, you know, these things are, these things are real and, and most people don't do it. Look, after 20 years of leading professional services firms in which the only product is people and everything is people, I, the, I mean, I, I feel like I could be a psychologist at this point because it's sure. we, we don't ever have product problems. The product is the people, the customers, the people, partners are the people. So when you learn to have these discussions with people and open, honest discussions like what's going on and you, you, just it's very interesting. There's two people on our team that went through this process that ha- that that liked each other, but they had a hard time in in, in a work scenario. There was a lot of conflict, and and they came to realize like it was two deep childhood <laughs> issues that were the, were the root uh, uh, of this. One person did have a real trauma in their childhood. And so it was about, about a family member dying and they kind of just lived in the world of like, they needed predictability and reliability and, and sort of no, and this other person felt very unheard and sort of shut down. And so they need to be throwing out ideas and trying new things and, and, and it, it, they just, it just didn't mesh yeah, <laughs> and they were constantly, yeah. but when they actually stripped it down to that, it was a very interesting understanding. I, you know, I have all kinds of notes here and questions I want to ask, but I, you're just triggering things that I want to ask about immediately. You yeah, have a sorry. Ted talk. I also know it's great. It's actually because, <laughs> um, for the audience, I think they, they know, but you know, Robert and I didn't do a, a pre-interview. I think we talked for 60 seconds and hit the play button to, to go record button to go here. Um, cause we just wanted this to be authentic. You have a TED Talk that uh, I also I, I watched this weekend to make sure I was ready for this. That you said uh, that you talk about the you know, no need for two. I forgot the title. It's like no need yeah, for elimin- two weeks eliminating two, how to eliminate two weeks notice. Yeah, yeah, and it's time. Sorry, um, it's time to end two weeks notice. I think time time title. to end. Yeah, you talk about two kinds of people. One, the people that 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 quietly quit, which is horrific for for everybody. Right, and, and then the other, the charade that happens between the employer and the employee. If you can just elaborate on what you shared in that talk, and for everyone, it's you, you should go look that up on YouTube and, and just type in Robert's name and, yeah, and so, TEDx. Yeah, so it's you'll interesting it, but... that you brought this up because it, so it just hit a hundred thousand views, and oh, I nice. actually wrote a book based on that TED talk four years ago, and I wrote it. I figured I'd launch it in two thousand twenty, and then this pandemic thing happened, <laughs> and then a great resignation thing happened, and then a layoff wave, and it just never was a good time. And 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 so I actually dusted it off, and I've been spending the last month kind of updating that book to I think oh, wow. I'm just going to release it uh on Substack later later this year because it's this playbook on how do we eliminate two weeks notice and yeah as you said we have this broken paradigm people are not going to work at companies forever we're not in the pension you know relationship mm-hmm. world uh anymore but we pretend that we are and most work relationships end with this hey can you talk um <laughs> which, which has two outcomes right it has the boss you know, totally, you know, perturbed that their kind of protege just gave two weeks notice and they had, you know, no idea that anything was, was, was wrong. And now all, everything that came before it is kind of ruined by, by the ending because we remember endings and beginnings uh, a lot more strongly than, than middles. Mm-hmm. And then on the flip side, 
you know, you have, hey, can you talk? And you come in, you find out, hey, your job is is over suddenly, and maybe this is your last day at work, and you're sort of blindsided. And, you know, I start the TED Talk off with sort of the analogy of, like, how would you feel if you were in a relationship and your partner came to you, you know, and told you that they were moving to a new city with a new person in two weeks, and you had no idea that they were even unhappy? Like, no one would think that's normal, but we've accepted this, and it's a decidedly American phenomenon, the sort of two weeks notice, which... It, I don't know how it, it doesn't really have to be in other com- countries. You can't even do that. You have to stay yeah. employed for months or they have to pay you for months. There's like a, a, a contract around that. Um, and look in the last couple of years, it's, it's dropped down to a day, but I, but I think so few people and on both sides appreciate just how damaging these like unnecessarily bad endings are. Yeah. I, I love how you started. I, I, I believe it's either in your book or in the, in, in that talk is you got a minute. I don't yeah. think I've ever had a great conversation on no. a Friday at 4.30 when somebody's coming to my office and said, do you got a minute when it's 4.30 on a Friday? Yeah, like, that, 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 never yeah. good. That, that is your, I think I said it either uh, the book or the draft of it that, you know, pit yeah. drops in your stomach as soon as yeah. you hear that. Yeah. yeah, as a boss, you nothing know what's good, coming next. Nothing good ever comes after that. Uh, ever, ever. Um, you've got a newsletter called Friday Forward that reaches over 200,000 people uh, across like 60 different countries. If you could talk to me about the genesis of Friday Forward, uh, I think I understand, but I'd love to hear how it it's grown to that and and what what the uh, what the genesis of it actually was. So the genesis was actually that same leadership retreat, and one of the things that we did was that we the we focused on a positive morning routine, and there are a bunch of different ones, and I've talked about them. This was a simple one of ten, ten, ten. So get up and just think quietly for ten minutes, read something positive, and then write you know for ten minutes each. Um, and I, and I kept doing that. And, and, and in the, in the read positive, we kind of got some like chicken soup for the soul books and quote books. And it, it just wasn't my sort of cup of tea. And so I, I decided like a couple weeks later, I'd try to merge this thing. Like I had some quotes and things that I'd been saving in a folder that I liked. We had a distributive team of like 40 people at the time. And so I, uh, I just, you know, decided, let me just kind of write something and share it with the team, uh, on Fridays. And I called it, different things. I think it was Friday inspiration. It would be like a story. Eventually I, the term capacity building, but came, but it was about something about getting better. It wasn't related to our business at all. And, and I sent these out. I didn't think anyone was reading them. Um, and then, you know, weeks later I get notes back. Like, I really love these. I shared it with my wife. I sent this to my brother. He sent it to his company. And I was like, Oh, huh. I wonder if these things, and they had a quote at the end and I, I'm a tinkerer. So I'd play around with the format. And I was like, I wonder if other people outside the company would would be interested. And people had been asking me to put them on. I was just managing it through a BCC, and I didn't have any sort of way for people to get to the old ones. So I bought like a $25 WordPress site. I sort of made a directory of these old ones. And I signed up for a newsletter service, but I kept it just a plain you know, email text. Uh, I just It was hard to manage it. And that way, if people wanted to be added... And I dropped like 300 friends and family on it, sent it out the next week. And I was like waiting for the hate mail, basically. <laughs> um, and it didn't come. I got more of the same. This is awesome. I sent this long. Uh, I was at an EO event and I told a couple of people I were doing it. They, 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 they asked me to send it to them. And one of them started his own and the other just said, this is great. We'll just send it to our company every week after I told them I thought it was kind of a good idea. So someone wrote an article a month or two later. This is the only newsletter I read. And then I'd wake up a couple of years later and it was like 100,000 people in 60 countries. I think now it's over 180 countries. And then oh, I, wow. I renamed it Friday Ford at some point because it was being forwarded uh, a lot. So I've, I've been doing that for, oh, we're on, uh, I think, number 410 or something like that now. Wow. Wow, that's cool. That is super cool. Has your career always been in the digital e-commerce marketing affiliate space? Because when I was reading your bio, a lot of it is around that. Is that where you started? Yeah, my my day job. You know, I came out of this kind of strategy, consumer technology, and then early on realized that sort of customer acquisition was a key differentiator. Uh, yeah. And then and then found this affiliate world and ended up building a business in this affiliate and partner ecosystem world. So yeah, that 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 has been a lot of my day job and and the last two companies that uh, I created. Yeah, I, I'm we're in the franchising space, and so of course you know 
acquisition of leads and prospects through both franchising yeah. and then for our members, uh, for, for members for recurring model for the the franchisees. Um, but you know, I read affiliate marketing and it, that whole space fascinates me because it is ginormous yet. The average person doesn't really know about it and doesn't, they understand don't know that. about it, but they interact yeah. with it every day, right? Uh, every it's, day. About, yeah. it's, it's about 20% of e-commerce. Anyone out there who follows influencers, who click on the products they buy, who read reviews, who read these, you know, five best humidifier lists and all this stuff. All of those are affiliate oriented things where instead of getting paid for a click or impression, it's tracked and, and, and the partner is paid a percentage of, of what it is they sell. So I, none of the content creators out there do this out of the goodness of, of their heart. They, you know, they want to make a living like the rest of us. And so the affiliate sure. model is the way that most of them get paid. Again, it's about, it's about 15 or 20% of, of e-commerce. It's just not as talked about, um, cause it's much more distributed than, you know, Facebook ads or, uh, Google ads. And also not everyone wants to make it kind of clear that that's how they're, you know, they, sure. you see a lot of disclosures now because the FTC requires it. But until then, people didn't, you know, want to sort of make that clear to, to a lot yeah. of their audience. Yeah. So if, you, if you've ever clicked on an ad or a, a, an article that's why X product sucks, yeah. and then at the end, you're convinced that it's an amazing product, probably an affiliate, <laughs> right? Probably an yeah, affiliate. Yeah, probably a nefarious one. But, but, yeah. but again, m more of any of the any of the um things you've read on the five best mattresses or the five sure. best any you know those things are all usually um affiliate uh yeah. oriented campaigns hey everyone as you know i don't have any advertisements nor sponsorships on this podcast my only ask of you the listener is that you share this podcast with someone that you know a friend a family member a coworker, or a colleague who may benefit from this information, may benefit from today's guest, from the value that they're they're sharing with the audience, with you, the listener. When you share this podcast and our audience grows, it allows me to book more and more guests who have a great message, great nuggets of wisdom that you can benefit from, and again, your network can benefit from. So please, right now, push that share button, send it to somebody that you care about, and let's get back to the interview. So if we get, switch gears a little bit, and with your team, you implemented a mindful transition program, and there's four key principles of that program. Is it possible for you to speak to that mindful transition, which I think probably has a link to your TED Talk as well, but, but those four principles of mindful transition? Yeah, and it's interesting because I'm, I'm, I'm in the sort of part of, of, of redoing that <laughs> yeah. uh, right now. Sure. Um, but yeah, so the, 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 uh, and I'll talk about how we sort of look at it uh, now and then thinking about, uh, cause I've, I've been updating that, but, but in terms of ending this two weeks notice and our, and having an open transition program, we had called ours mindful transition in the beginning um, during the Ted talk. And then we changed the name to be our employee transition program, but it all starts with um, psychological safety, like having this fundamental freedom, like we can discuss things at our company and it's okay to discuss problems because that's how this, you, you, you surface this. Um, and, and from psychological safety, you're kind of going to open and honest communication. So, Hey, Roger, like I'm not happy in what I'm doing. What are the other things that I could do? So I can't do that unless there's psychological safety. Yeah. Um, but then by saying that, I feel like Roger's gonna be like, all right, let's talk about this. Not, well, then get the bleep out of here and let me walk you out, sure. um, today. Um, you know, so then, you know, from there, sort of the next level is, um, this commitment to mutually beneficial outcomes. So what, what, what can we do, um, in understanding and sometimes look, it's not exactly what someone wants, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to be, you know, mutual respect, um, we're mm -hmm. going to treat each other with respect here and we're going to try to get the best outcome possible. So if the outcome means that, you know, you're no longer going to be working here because that's just the right decision for the business, we're going to try to do that in the best way possible that sets you up, you know, for your next thing and support you understanding that there's limits to that. But but how can we make a good of outcome as possible on that? And again, the conclusion of all of those things is you should be able to eliminate this concept of, of two week notice because you'll start these conversations earlier. You'll get data that tells you that, you know, Roger's not doing so well. And I'll sit down with Roger and Roger will be like, look, I just don't want to do this. Like, yep. and I'm like, okay, well, let's, 
is there something else here for you? And if there is not, how can we support you in the transition out of the company and, and do that over a couple months? So it gives the person the cover and the flexibility they need to do. Look, we were in a services business. So people leaving, you know, who work on client projects suddenly is, is t- terrible for the client. Yeah. And so yeah. we, we, we would rather know that they're leaving, but ha- you know, have them be around and be present so that we can have a much more well orchestrated transition. And so, um, I think we were an early pioneer in this program. We certainly weren't the first, but I, I think companies with a lot deeper pockets had done similar things, but in order, and, and that's what the book about is giving people the playbook to say, look, if you feel like this whole two week thing is incongruous with the kind of culture that you're trying to build, how do you actually, um, change that? And so, yep. as I said, I'm in, actually in the, in the middle of, <laughs> it's amazing how much has changed in three to four years, but, but sure. kind of revising all that and, and hope to, to release it, um, this summer. I think you even give an example. I, I can't remember, like the, I think you picked a name, David, I believe where the gentleman, you asked him, somebody asked him, do you enjoy what you do? And he's like, no, I don't enjoy this at all. And I would rather do X, Y, Z. And then it was a a vendor or a partner that ended up emailing you saying, Hey, we're looking for somebody like, out of the blue. And he said, I've, I've got the, I've got a guy. And then he, like, he goes to work for somebody who ends up becoming one of your oh, customers yeah. or vendors. So, so- yeah. Yeah. So, um, I wasn't sure which example the patient did or that one. So that, that's one of my favorite stories. Um, and I I don't remember the pseudonym, but we'll call it David, I think was probably the pseudonym. Um, so David worked with us and, um, the job, uh, really discovered that he loved data, um, and analytics and making these decisions, but the job that he was doing for us and inevitably became more client service oriented uh, at that level. And he was really getting into this data and analytics stuff. We were having open honest conversations with him. We we're like, look, we don't know if this job is going to exist here for a while. And so we were kind of thinking about like, what would this look like? And, you know, how do we, if he really wants to do this and, and it's not the job he's doing, this is not a great situation for the long run. In the middle of this, um, I get an email from uh, someone I know at a fairly large company, and they're like, we're looking for this person and this job. Do you know anyone? I send it around to a few people on my management team. They all respond with the same thing. They were like, who knew this guy? They're like, that's David's dream job, basically. (laughs) (laughs) And we just felt like the the right thing to do. So I replied to her, and I said, look, this may be a little bit weird, but like, (laughs) it's actually a guy on my team who we've been having some open conversations with, this is what he wants to do. And, and, and I'm totally fine uh, with you talking to him about if he wants to do it. And I reached out to him and said, look, we don't want to lose you, but like you should interview for this job. This is a fortune 50, you know, company. Um, and he interviewed and got the job and picked up and moved to California and has worked at that company seven years later and has done in- incredibly well. And, and, you know, is a, is one of our, you know, alumni that we, you know, care about. And he is, he has great feelings about, you know, working here. And so again, just one of those kind of positive endings. But it's also because you've, you set the table for somebody to have, to have that converse, conversation in a comfortable man, in a safe environment, psychologically yeah. safe is to borrow your term. And usually, you know, if we're trying to push somebody to another employer, it's because we think they're a bad performer where that was not the yeah, case at all with sounds, this gentleman. It just, sounds, yeah, it's just, it's just yeah. we have the discussion. Look, he was going to, if we didn't have those discussions, he was going to be the person one day that started looking around and got a job. And then they were going to say to him, you need to start in two weeks. And, you know, that's how that story was going to end. And we were going to be pissed at him and it wouldn't be sure. the same that, that yeah. it was today. And I make this point in, in the yet to be released uh, book, but I think it's really important to say to employees out there, it, the the employer or the company has to go first in the setting of psychological safety and make sure that it's safe. And most companies, it's not okay to have these dialogues. And so yeah. I don't think you should go be a pioneer at the open dialogue if the company ha- you know, has a track record of walking everyone to the door you know, as soon as they have these discussions. So it is up to the organization, the leaders to change the paradigm and say, look, we want to know about problems. We want to know if you're not engaged. We want to know if you do something else. We promise we won't walk you to the door. We want to find you know, a better outcome here. And, 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 and it actually takes a lot of repetition and showing and storytelling for people to actually believe that we even struggled, you know, rolling this out and having a Ted talk 
when people give two weeks notice, I was so pissed. Um, but then yeah. we dive into it and they just, they didn't believe it. And their parents told them you never do this. And you know, yeah. it, it took a lot of work to get people. We actually even incentivized it. We started saying, look, if you give us eight weeks notice, we will pay you a bonus. So when you start to put money behind something, then people do yeah. understand that that's the behavior that you're looking for. Yeah. Incentivize what you want to see. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You'd mentioned it earlier, uh, but just in passing, uh, capacity building, the term capacity building, yeah. which is something you've, you've fully, you know, ingratiated in your companies and, and, and you teach. Speak to that, what it is and how can someone institute that at their company? Yeah, so so we all have the ability to get better, and and to me, capacity building is the the long definition is the method by which individuals seek, uh, acquire, and develop the skills and ability to consistently perform at a higher level in pursuit of their innate potential. The simple version, I think, this is how we get better. Um, it's not about doing more. It's not about doing the. Right, it's about doing the right things, and it has four buckets. Um, spiritual, intellectual, physical, and emotional capacity. And if you picture these as quadrants, right, and you're growing these kind of in the same thing, your mass is increasing, it's a ball, it rolls downhill. If one of these things is super out of whack, it's going to go all over the place. And and um, I've really been able to track kind of improvement for most of the high performers I've seen in life to kind of these four buckets that people have strong command on. And I'm happy to sort of double click on, on each of yeah. those. Please, yeah, please do. So, so spiritual capacity is not religious. Uh, I tried a hundred other terms, um, but it's understanding who you are, what you want most, and the standards you want to live by each day. So, for for most individuals, this manifests itself most in the core values, which we were talking a lot about before. Like, who am I? What do I want? What's the that is just the foundation for most of us. And then, and then I can also get into they mean a little different things and elevate your team. These are the personal definitions, but elevate your team. I talked about a little more. What do these mean in the context of an organization rather than an individual? Um, Intellectual capacity is how you improve your ability to think, learn, plan, and execute with discipline. So this is your personal operating system, right? How do I get? How do I do it better and faster and with less energy? It's not necessarily about more. You know, someone who's listening to this podcast or learning a new tactic or learning a new way to do something, and so the next time they can do it better. Physical capacity is your health, well-being, and physical performance, and this is the one that often kind of derails us. And then emotional capacity is how you react to challenging situations, your emotional mindset, and the quality of your relationship. So it's kind of the things out, outside of you. So if you met, these go in order because it's like, look, we need to know what we want, then we want to kind of get better and improve, then we kind of have the desire, once we're in that direction, the importance of maintaining our physical and mental health is sort of elevated and then also it really, in you know, you put your car out on the road, I like to say, like it, you build a great car, then it becomes how are we, who are the people we're choosing interact with, not interact with that, you know, the people we pick on that journey. And again, they, and, and, and how are we about the things that we control and, and that we don't control? Um, and, and so that's how all of those things come together. Well, one, thank you for that. And, and then two, I, I, we right before we hit play, you know, we talked for 60 seconds or so. I said I love some of your quotes and some of the quotes that you that you uh, and you cited them, but but that the, you took from others in, in your book. And one of them, I don't even know if there's a citation, but it, it's you know it's like a, a meme or whatever you know. I don't whatever yeah. I can't find the word, but I love this adage. And it's so simple, but my God, is it brilliant? You quote where this little story where a CFO says to a CEO, <laughs> "What if we train our people and we spend all the money and they leave?" And the CEO responds with, what if we don't and they stay? Robert, that is pure gold because so many companies I feel are worried, well, if we up-level their skills and we send them to that course and that retreat and invest here, well, then their market value goes up. We probably won't be able to keep up and they'll bail. But my God, what if we don't and, and they just stay where they're at? And that's, and that yeah, is not and the look, common, I, common If you're wisdom, a growing yeah. company, you should be doing everything you can to increase the capacity of your people. And again, in this world where I think, you know, McKinsey's done it for years, but it's about alumni, right? It's about po- that actually you have a, a positive group of alumni that have worked at your company, that are out in the world, that are hiring your company, that are advocating for your company. And so I think you should try your best to build the capacity of the people on your team and then you need to make those hard decisions when it's not enough or it's too much and you don't have the opportunity with them and you need to love them and let them go. Um, yeah. But I still think, I, I I believe in karma, right? And again, I think if you, to that example of that person who we've helped, like ironically, we're about to win a huge 
deal with that company, you know, years later, like there's just positive, yeah. um, karma of these things. So, um, you don't have a chance if you're, if your talent's not growing. And then again, you may have the problem where they're not growing enough or they're growing too much. And that's where you, these things aren't mutually exclusive. That's where you need to make difficult business decisions. You can say this person's yeah. trying really hard, but they're not growing fast enough for the job. Or again, this, we don't have a job that's going to satiate this person and I, I'm going to lose them eventually. So do I help them do that? Or do I sort of wait till I'm blindsided one day? Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe you even cite in there. I, I was a, I'm still my guess, but I was a huge Jack Welsh fan because I was coming of age professionally when he was yeah. at his, at his height. And he, you know, there was a book published either by him or about him like every other week, it seemed like, you know, sometime in the, in the early nineties. And when he was naming, you, you saw it when he was naming, deciding on who his successor was like the, the, the moment, you know, the, the Tuesday or whatever that he said, yeah. here's my successor. Everyone knew that those guys were going to, everybody, yeah, were gonna, they, yeah we're gonna they were gone. Here. They were gone. And, but it was, but it wasn't, it was like, of course, of course. And they went on to run huge companies and write books themselves. Yeah, so, and the whole so thing, in, yeah. interesting though, they all failed pretty dramatically. Um, and the, the, I wrote a Friday Ford about this, but I think it's important that we revisit things. Certain things turn to wine over time and certain yeah. things turn to vinegar. The Jack Welsh School of Management has has turned to vinegar over time. True. Um, Truly has. I think if we look at what happened to GE, um, Nadrali went on to disaster at Home Depot. The other went on to disaster at 3M. You know, they were brought up in an era of cost cutting and financial management, um, which worked at that time, but it, it is interesting. It has not aged well. You know, yeah. that interview story and the airplane story, it, it has not aged well. <laughs> and I think people who are truly students are, have to be willing to look at that and change their mind about that and evaluate that. But yes, the, the lesson of they were both going to be CEOs uh, w was right, but they were both terrible CEOs who, who did not have good outcomes and also jeff immel objectively had yeah. a pretty terrible outcome wasn't it nearly wasn't yeah. jack welsh for sure the and the, i i'm i'm still a fan of what he did i love to be number one or number two or get out yeah but uh, certainly and i've i've recommended his books to younger people that have asked me for books uh, book recommendations but i say don't take away from it the command and control that they had the liberty of back then because the labor yeah, force doesn't, doesn't work today. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Look, you being do this number or, one or two in your market yeah. is, is, is excellent advice, you know, but yeah. there are a lot of other things that they did along through. I, I think actually too many companies, and this was a Friday for two weeks ago are just diversifying too soon and trying to do different things. And they, you know, they're not even number one in one market before they're <laughs> entering multiple markets. And that's almost rarely a recipe for success. Now you have two mediocre companies. Yeah. 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 No, for sure. Um, this, uh, I've done something like this at a company. I, I, I feel very fortunate. I, I've talked a lot of smack about corporate America, but I'm also incredibly uh, grateful for what I learned and, and, and the leadership development and, you know, the myriad courses they put me through. I, I'm very grateful for that. And I remember doing something like this and I, for, I forgot what we called it at this one pharmaceutical company, but you call it one last talk. And it's a practice you've incorporated where, you know, it's, it's incredibly powerful and it gives the liberty to an employee or a group of a small group of employees to really deeply share. Please speak to one last talk and, and how that's impacted your company. Yeah. So I got to know a gentleman named Philip McKernan really well, who wrote the one last talk book and did this program. And we had a big company event every year called our AP Summit. And we had done uh, employee TED Talks at it where people signed up and picked up t topics and they weren't work. They were personal or something or otherwise. And um, I, when I, you know, I was always sort of pushing the envelope of these things. And I said to Philip, hey, would you be interested if people were interested in doing this at our, our company event and coaching people to one last talks? And he was like, this is great. I've never done this before. You know, he's, he was like me. Let's let's try it. And so we reached out to some people. Honestly, like I didn't know if we'd have any takers, but we had kind of eight people for four slots and we kind of whittled it down. They practiced with him for months. And one last talk is not Philip's the type of person where you cannot get away with a three tips to a better life. Like this is like a real like I'm exiting stage left tomorrow. And what is the thing I've left unsaid that needs to be said? And so four employees got up there and gave uh, in front of, you know, 150, 60 other employees 
kind of poured their heart out for these uh, one last talks. I mean, one was about coming out in the workplace. Another was uh, about having a finding out they had a de degenerative family disease. Uh, another was about running away from home at a young age. And there wasn't like a dry eye after these things were were given. You know, the people showed up, shared things about them that no one had any idea. When I saw some of those speakers after their speeches, they just had this look of like peacefulness and like, mm -hmm. you know, that they had really like told their story. Like they just looked happy. Like they were nervous, but they had shared it. And the interesting thing was like, I, it it actually opened like Pandora's box over the next 24 to 48 hours at the event where people were sharing and talking about things and things that they had never, people they worked with for five years. In fact, I tell everyone, be a little careful. Like we had a hard time like putting it <laughs> back in the box at some point. We're like, we don't sure. really have therapists on staff here. And like people aren't necessarily trained to have this discussion um, so, uh, that was one of the downsides. This, I say, this is a level like 202 or 303 class. I would not, I would not do this if you don't have psychological sharing and vulnerability and these sort of things at your company. But it was just amazing to me, like what happened after those speeches. And it just showed you that when people lead with that sort of vulnerability, it just gives permission to other people to do the same. Yeah. Uh, quickly, I'll share, as you were sharing that, it took me back to that time. It was called a lifeline exercise. Yeah, I've done and, that so many times. Yeah, We've done and, that too. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but it was for the first, the first guy that got. It was, it was a management retreat, some hunting lodge or something. The first guy that got up and did it, did a resume walk. Right, that was his because nobody knew what you could really say or couldn't say. Yeah. And then the next person got up and, like one of your employees, just opened her heart and you know, shared ups and downs in life and her lifeline was all kinds of crazy and circles and roller coasters. And, and it gave permission to everyone after that to get real. And I felt so much closer to colleagues I'd worked with for three or four years after that three hour process to hear, Oh, that's who they really are. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and but it's but you're right. Like until you make some connect. We had, we had people that worked together for years, and both of their dads had had a similar whatever experience. I don't, but but like they had no idea. Yeah. Um, but you also said something in there that's really important. In any of these things, and maybe this exception was a little bit different, but in any of these things or sharing or intro, I talk about this in Elevate Your Team. Introducing vulnerability in the workplace, the leader has to go first right? They have to set the tone. And we had a facilitator who showed this to me years ago. So we had everyone stand in a circle. He's like, we're going to talk about something you don't know about me bef before. And, you know, he said, I used to ski, whatever it was, ski. And everyone went around. And then he did this intentionally. And the second time he was like, my dad was an alcoholic. And every night I had to figure out like who was going to get hit and where I hit under the stairs and I and did this. And then we went around again. And it was like, totally different story so yeah. it, it, in any of these things if you're doing these exercises or you're you're saying like highs and low from the weekend which is trying to introduce some vulnerability you know into these dialogue and discussion the leader always sets the tone yeah uh, amen amen um lastly in in your book elevate your team which uh, again uh, available where books are sold and a wonderful read and a real read too like just you can tell with the way Robert is conversing now. It's just it's just very authentic. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the th uh, the three types of organizations you talk about, and which is really related to everything we're talking about: star stiflers, catch and releasers, and pure meritocracies. Yeah. So um, the first place I ever worked was was a star stifler organization. I I, I won't name it, um, but so there, I, I worked. So with was this mine. That's so funny. So <laughs> was my first place, and I left after two. I'm like. This place sucks. I so can't. Yeah, I worked with this incredible group of people, like young so. people who had just graduated business school and college, and they have all gone on to like do like amazing things. Yeah. The sort of level of management that had been there forever and just figured out to master the organ, they, they had no external value and just sort of like held on and tried to keep their jobs and, and until the company kind of went went under, which is not not a surprise. Um, and I, and when I think about everyone I work with now, I'm like, wow, they've done such incredible things. So they were really good at like attracting talent, but then it became very clear to that talent that we're not getting past these like incumbents who are just going to protect their, their jobs. Yeah. So that's star stifling organization. That's where talent goes to die. Uh, I like to say, so catch and release, uh, is sort of what I described before where organization where they're going to train someone up, they're going to do their best. But if they realize that 
you know, they don't have the right thing for that person. They're going to help them figure that out and, 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 and go there and, and move there. True meritocracy, I don't know that any organization can be this all the time because I think it would be really disruptive. But my example in the book was um, was Bill Belichick and sort of how he ran the New England mm-hmm. Patriots for years. And, and Tom Brady would have never been Tom Brady because there's a whole story behind it in the book of, of the starting quarterback who was the highest paid person in the league got knocked out for three or four games. Um, and this backup that no one knew came, came in and he was just playing like really well. And, and Bill Belichick was, when he came back, everyone thought he was going to go back to the bench. And he's like, no, this, I'm going with this guy. Like, and, and we may not even know the name Tom Brady, you know, had he not made that decision. Uh, and very few people would, would make that. So in a true meritocracy, you know, if, if, if I'm your manager and you're better than me, you get the job, right? Yeah. Um, you, 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 you do with the catch and releasers. A lot of times the catch and release happens because people are afraid to rock the boat or to say, look, Roger's a superstar, but like, and I know he's better than Stacy, but like, I just can't mess with that. Um, yeah. so that's why I say, I don't think you can be it all the time. I think it would be disruptive, but a true meritocracy is constantly put, they don't care. Bill Belichick never cared what you were paid, what you were, where you were drafted or otherwise, whoever was the playing the best, you know, went in the game and started the game. He just had no kind of sunk costs, um, fallacy. Yeah. And I think a lot of organizations stick with the sunk cost and, and there's good reasons for your talent to leave. And there's bad reasons for your talent to leave, right? If you have two outstanding CFO candidates and only one CFO job, kind of like the Jack Wells, great. If, if you have a, a superstar controller and a mediocre CFO, and you're not willing to make that trade, that's a terrible, um, outcome, right? For your organization. Yep. Yeah. And a hard decision that a lot of people will shy away from. Yeah, it's it's yeah. hard for people to make that choice. And like I said, it's a little bit disruptive, right? To think at any time, you know, you have no institutional bias. You know, you put the best player on the team, but that's what great teams do. They put, you know, whoever's yeah. practicing the best, who's ever's playing the best and putting up the most points, like they get to start. Um best player you know, in the field. that's I know people don't like sports analogies, but I think they're very apt in a lot of places in leadership, particularly around what coaches do differently than leaders and you know coaches yeah. can't go on the field <laughs> they yeah. never ever go on the field they have That's to good. do everything from the sideline and actually coach and i think a lot of leaders would be better off if that was true for them that thank you for that nugget because i i just had never thought of that analogy that's absolutely i have so many people in, in my network and our franchise network that they have to get out of the way of their people Easier said than done. I admit, easier said yeah. than done. But because they can step onto the field, but they have to yeah. really approach their business. You as get a, a pretty coach. big penalty in the uh, <laughs> either league if you <laughs> try to do that. But but that's is what coaching true. is, and that's what leading yeah. is, rather than taking over and doing. Right? You call yeah. the timeout. You sit. You go over it. You say you didn't. You don't grab the ball from their hand and say, "This is how." I mean, it's so. It's just such an interesting analogy when you think. About yeah. It. No, I, I I love that. Love it. Um, all right, a couple last questions, and obviously yeah, your book's fantastic, and I know you have others, and you have another one coming out soon. Is there a book that you could recommend to the audience? And again, most of the listeners are uh, advancing their career in in uh, a, a, a current company or they're entrepreneurs who have their own company and trying to level up their business. In that context, Robert, is there a, a book that you read that when you set it down, you thought, whoa, okay, that I look at things differently now from whatever perspective you know whatever business perspective that book was about is there anything you could is there one that you could recommend that really had an impact on you yeah so one of my favorite books uh both title and content is called mistakes were made but not by me um and this is sort of the definitive book on on cognitive dissonance and i think we like hear the term cognitive dissonance but if you if you don't know what it is it's just an incredibly pervasive force in our lives and why we make a lot of bad decisions and repeat our mistakes and they really go into it in that book and dissect it. And I, when I learned how to sort of spot that and notice it and, and realize it in other situations, um, I just think it's, uh, I think it's behind a lot of the poor decisions that people make and why they get stuck in these things that they can't get uh, out of. So yeah. it's, it, it's a great book and it's a fun read. Do, do you remember the author's name any chance? Because we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, I have, not, I, want, I, have, I, have, yeah. I have it right here. It, there, there are two uh, authors. I'm going to knock over these things. Hold on. Uh, I can't. Sorry, I can't remember now. It's uh, 
it's Carol Tavares and then I, I, I and Elliot. I forget Elliot's last name, but it's written sure. it's written by two two people. Okay, yeah. Well, I'll I'll, I'll f- have, make sure that my producer puts that in the show notes, and that will be in my Amazon list uh, here by tonight. Uh, all right, couple last questions, not a hundred percent related to what we've talked about, but the fact that you started off and said that you you know you figured out what your values were and, and your core values, which created your your mission. Um, my second to last question for you is, and it's a little different, but if we were to fast forward at, to the end of your life and, and Robert, we're, you know, we're at your funeral and you're looking down upon this and a loved one is reading your eulogy, but that loved one can only pick three words to describe you, three descriptors. What three words do you hope they pick to describe you and the life that you lived? Um, you know, I've done a lot of eulogy exercises, but not but not that one. So not not yeah. three words, but three yeah. descriptors. Okay, uh, supportive, uh, authentic, and catalyst. Ooh, catalyst! Never heard. That's great. I haven't heard that before. I love that. And you know that if you've done a eulogy exercise, like that is one of the most powerful things I think a person can do. Those are incredibly hard. I I actually yeah. we had a a forum retreat for my YPO forum and. I've done different versions of it, you know, in the past in leadership training. This one, we had to write it, tell us who was reading it, and then read it in their voice. It was like incredibly hard to do. <laughs> it, it, I'll tell you what, it gets your priorities straight when you realize yeah. I need to get busy living. Yeah, and then, and then the, 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 the facilitator, you're like, you're like my kids, like which one of your kids? <laughs> like, oh, like, you know, so <laughs> he was, he was not letting anyone out of any, any, <laughs> any of this. So yeah, <laughs> oof. oof. I haven't done that one yet. Wow. Um, all right. And then uh, before we 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 uh, you share how people can follow you and get a hold of you, maybe subscribe to Friday Forward. Um, one last question: If you had a magic wand, this one's kind of fun. If you had a magic wand, and I gave you this magic wand, and you could wave it and make one change to the world, the wor- the way the world operates, the way the world is, the way things are, when we wake up tomorrow, if you wave that magic wand tonight, how would the world be different according? To Robert Glazer, uh, I would destroy social media, um, mm. and uh, I think it would replace quantity of connections with quality of connections, which seems to be our biggest epidemic right now. Is 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 loneliness, despite mm. the outward effect of the outward appearance of being in touch of, with so many people. I don't know, last time I checked, everybody has an amazing life on Instagram. Like everybody's living an amazing life, right? <laughs> <laughs> I thought everybody was happy and top perfect. One per- and- top one percent, yeah, totally, yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, um, one uh, be- before you know we go, I just want to thank you so much for coming on. Like this has just been such a fun, easy conversation, and um, you're just you're obviously so passionate about developing others and being a coach, leading versus you know, just top down and, and uh, I've really, really enjoyed this. How, other than, than, than picking up a copy of Elevate Your Team and, or another one of your books, how can people follow you, connect with you, just be part of sure. your journey? Yeah, I've integrated everything under Robert Glazer, G-L-A-Z-E-R.com. So the core value course is there. If people want to dig yep. in, you can sign up for Friday Four. The books are there. I have a podcast called The Elevate Podcast where we talk a lot about these things. So um, whatever is the easiest place to to, to dive into all things are, are, are right there. Cool. Super. That makes it super easy. We'll put that in the show notes as well. Um, again, man, thank you so much for coming on today. I really, really appreciate your time. Great. Thank you very much, Roger. Thank you for tuning in to the Thrive More podcast. Don't forget to take a look at the show notes for any of the resources that we mentioned during the podcast. And if you haven't already, be sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on your notifications so you have access to the latest and the greatest. You can connect with me on any of the socials at Real Roger Martin. And be sure to check out our website, thrivemorebrands.com. There you'll find information on the brands we support and information on franchising. Thanks again for tuning in.